Welcome back everyone, Mike McConville here. We have all seen examples of relict guitars. This, this Strat here is Aaron, who's a longtime customer, good friend, locally. And, uh, you know, they've done a pretty cool job of, of relicking this Strat. But have you ever seen a relict acoustic guitar? So anyone who's even mildly involved with the guitar industry has certainly seen one of these Art and Luthery little parlor guitars that have kind of taken the market by storm. Penny for penny, they're pretty hard to beat. This guitar is also owned by a longtime customer, local guy, good friend. Matt has several guitars, so he just dropped this one off to get a tweak, compensated nut, get it kind of playing to the max. But I got something else to show you. So on the other tech deck, here is the relict version of this Art and Luthery guitar. How's that for a bit of playing wear? <laughs> This has had a rough ride, but Ken absolutely loves this little guitar. We're going to take care of it for him. And as always, you'll get a play-by-play, step-by-step. Button your seatbelts, people. This is going to be quite a ride. I recently did a Larabe guitar for Ken, this customer, and obviously he's logged in some uh, pretty serious time on this one. The bridge is lifting. That's the first thing. It's got to come off and be re-glued. So let's start there. Well, as we get started here, I wanted to bring you in close enough for you to be able to see. So here's a good close look, and you can see that bridge is coming up all the way across to about here. So we're going to heat that up, slip that off, and we'll start there. We'll set that timer for seven minutes. There's our seven minutes. So we'll take the first run at that. So I did heat up that probe on the buffer. So the idea is you want heat that is hot enough to kind of to allow that probe to kind of sink into the glue line but obviously not so hot that you're going to scorch the top. Yeah, you know something? I think we're going to need a little more I think we may need a second run on this to, to get that off. Okay, time to reheat. Okay, here's round two. Seven minutes. You don't go 14 minutes. <laughs> you do seven minutes and see how you make out. And then uh, if you need to reheat, which we do. The shop is a little cool right now too, so I think it's it cooled off a little quickly. Uh, but this is a cedar top, so you need to proceed with maybe even a little more caution than you would on a more resilient spruce top. We'll wait for that rosewood to sweat again. You'll see beads of resin start to sweat out of the wood when you know you've heated it clean through to the glue line. Just bringing you in close enough to see those little beads of resin sweat out of the floor of the saddle slot. So we're just about there, the second run round. And we'll pull everything out of the way and slip that on the glue joint. So I got that to release from the halfway point over to the treble side. So I'm favoring the base side of the bridge. Now we're going to give it another seven minutes. It's cooling off pretty quick. I just came out a little while ago to turn the heat on in the shop. And it's, uh, it's a little cool out here yet. So give that another run. One of the most difficult things to do is to prepare the bridge surface to get an intimate contact with the soundboard surface. So this disc is not flat. It actually has, you can barely, it, the camera barely even picks it up, but it's a 24 foot spherical radius. The other thing that's nice about this is typically over time the steel string bridge wants to pull up like so and it creates what people refer to as a belly behind the bridge. And also the action raises. So one of the bonuses of having 
this sander is that as I'm sanding I can actually tilt, lean towards the back side of the bridge slightly and buy back all of that real estate of string pull. When I'm done I am going to put this bridge after it's sanded on the ground surface of my jointer table and you'll see just how slight that radius is. Okay, here we go. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of favoring the back side here. So you can see the squirrel marks and on the outside edge we haven't quite touched yet so I'm kind of leaning on the back half of the bridge here. Years ago I used to make up sort of a radius block and let the students kind of do it by hand, but man, this fast tracks that job big time. We have arrived, 100% contact, over to the joiner table. So as I bring you in close, see how slight that radius is? But because it's a spherical radius, the bottom side of that surface has been held up against a ball 48 feet high. It means that the perimeter of the bridge will make contact before the center of the bridge will. And that little bit of flexing is going to guarantee you 100% contact. Now, if you look closely at this edge, you'll see how the wing of the bridge is thinner on that back half. So I have actually tilted the bridge back, which does a couple of things. It buys back all that real estate of years of string pull, but it also increases the tension at the focal point on the saddle. Think about this. The saddle's in like so. As the bridge leans up, the amount of tension decreases at that focal point. As it tilts back, it gets tighter. So this is just good physics for the guitar all the way around, acoustically and structurally. Okay, let's go look at the guitar. Now we're preparing that top surface to receive that bridge one more time. Except this time, we're getting a, an even more intimate fit than the original factory fit because we're coming right to the outside extremities Depressor because you don't want to use your finger, you'll dig a hole. The tongue depressor creates a nice, a perfect flat surface to receive that radius bridge foot. Another reason why Ken's in love with this guitar is that soft cedar top is the best choice possible for a small soundboard like this. It's going to give you way more bass than you would normally have with a spruce top, especially with the smaller plantilla or the smaller soundboard. So I'm bringing you in close to show you the sort of geometry that happens when you put that spherical radius on the foot of the bridge. Now this is the dry run, but you'll see when I actually do the wet run and glue it, uh, we'll get glue squeeze 360. So this bridge will never lift again, guaranteed. Now the other thing, and you know, I, I mean you see online people clamping the top down and getting rid of the belly and... I'm sorry, but I just don't get it. Why would you force the belly down like that? There's no reason for it. It's natural for a guitar to pull up like that after 30, 40, 50, 100 years. In most cases, you just leave it alone. If you're changing the bridge plate, that might give you an opportunity to kind of soften the radius that's pulled up over the course of a half a century or a quarter of a century. But in most cases, no, I never try to flatten the belly on an acoustic guitar. You're adding unneeded stress. And even if you do flatten the belly, well, you probably end up popping a few braces in the process. 
So no belly flattening here. This isn't a keto diet. On the end here you can see how much this bridge has been tilted back which increases the tension at the focal point on the saddle. The other thing is we're actually reducing the mass of the bridge. This was pretty thick. You'll see the thickness of the bridge on that brand new Art and Luthery, same model. It's quite a bit thicker. So we're lightening, reducing the mass, we're increasing the gluing surface, and we're tightening up the focal point on the saddle all the way across. So I just wanted to show you the dry run. I'm all set up. I have a little clamp pad here. You'll see when I take it apart. This call bridges the saddle slot and puts pressure on the middle of the bridge and you'll see the glue squeeze when I go to clean that up. I'll bring you in for a good close look. Just using regular carpenter's glue for this one. I am heating it up a little bit. I like to have warm wood, warm glue when I'm gluing. So I've actually raised the temperature in the shop and I'm heating up the wood glue a little bit before we uh, spread it. Here we go. Kind of overamped on the glue here. <laughs> All right, so let me just scoop some of that up. Got my glue shovel. Okay, that's a little more like it. Well, we're definitely not starving that joint, that's for sure. I said I kind of overamped a little bit, but better a little too much than not enough. Okay, so we got those fasteners in and they are a smaller diameter than the hole. It allows me to actually line up that bridge with the original footprint. So I'm going to snug them down just a little bit by hand. And then I've got my scoop up sticks here. I'm going to take up the lion's share of that glue squeeze. This way I can actually see the footprint of where the bridge was originally. Yeah, that's got to come forward. And this is the back side. Again, haven't torqued it right down yet. Getting it into place first. Got half a dozen of these sticks done up. It's a clamp I made up five years ago. I like to have the clamp in two pieces. This is a little tricky to get in this one. A little bit smaller sound hole and a smaller guitar. We get the clamps in place first. Okay. These are the clamping blocks for the wings. They actually have a radius on the inside so that we get the pressure. When we clamp we get the pressure where we want it on these outside tips. Good, liking that. Other side, other side. So I keep the blocks back so that they are not in the way of my little scoop up stick. When it comes time to scoop up the glue, which is going to be very shortly, now I have a little oak call that kind of hops over the bridge slot and this basically puts the pressure on the center of the bridge. Well, unfortunately the battery died for me just as I was cleaning up that glue squeeze. 
So we'll have to get that on the next uh, bridge re-glue for you. So I've let this sit for about an hour and a half, so it'll be fine now. We'll get it out of these clamps. There's a bunch more work i got to do yet. We're not done with this one. Just wanted to get that bridge re-glue out of the way first. So that's the fastener configuration I use, so two rubber lined washers. Like I mentioned earlier, the diameter is slightly smaller than the bridge pinholes to allow you the luxury to kind of shift the bridge ever so slightly to get it dead on, which we did. So another bonus of uh, radiusing the foot of the bridge and actually thinning it down from the underside. So that neck to body angle is perfect now. We'll be able to put the action anywhere he wants it. Well, my next step is to heat up that label inside and peel it back because th this bottom fastener needs to be snugged down. We can't get at it with that label on there. So, I'm going to make a longer extension for this hair dryer so I can get right in tight to that label. Okay, we'll see if we can peel back that label. Will it peel or will it rip? I'm trying my best to, to peel it back, but it just doesn't work out that way all the time. So, a little bit more heat. So, we did get lucky. So, I peeled that label back. Don't take it off. Just fold it back like a page uh, so that we can put it right back where it belongs. And you, I don't know if the camera's showing this or not, but that, that bolt is indeed loose. It needs to be snugged down. I'll bring you over to the heel and you can see what I mean. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. That bolt on the inside needs to be tightened up. This is with no string tension. So it, this is, was one of the reasons why it was pulling up so high. Okay, so we'll get in there and snug that There's down. our wrench configuration. We've got to get in there. So we're on that bolt. Now, you've got to remember, and I've mentioned this in other videos, don't reef on this. It's metal against wood. Wood's going to lose every time. So I'm looking at the space here in the heel, and it looks like I've kind of got that in snug. That's all it took. Just a couple of turns. Frets are dressed. The action's lowered. The saddle has been lowered. Of course, the bridge, like as you saw, was just re-glued. The compensated nut blank is cut, and I just checked the seventh fret and the corresponding octave. Eight cents sharp on the low E. 5 cents and 6 cents, respectively, the three bass strings. G is bang on the money. The B is 4 cents flat. And the high E is 2 cents flat. This presents a pretty unique challenge. There's a bit of room to lower the action on the bass side. So I'm going to start with that and get another read. So here's a little trick for hanging on to those nuts and saddles and veneers and little bits and pieces as your fingers get closer and closer to the disc sander. This is essentially a continuous hinge, two-sided tape and 120 grit sanding paper. I have this as you know on a foot switch and I have just sanded that base side down. We're trying to reduce the sharpness on those three bass strings. So back to the guitar, we're going to take another read on this. To tighten up those strings all the way across. So I've taken a tracing off the original saddle 
and marked those original values all the way across just so we know where we're going with this but this is a horse of a different color. The cantilever on this saddle is actually going back towards the bridge pins. Anyways we'll pick up on this in the morning give you step by step. So here's where we got to start. These are the actual values that were on the original saddle. I've got all these values marked so we know how much to adjust. Now this came right to the very back of the saddle so it's got to go eight cents so I'm going to move it back to about here. The, this, is, this was in dead center in the original saddle. It's got to come back five cents so we're going to start there. This needs to move back six cents. I'm going to bring it back to about here. We'll start there. The G was perfect so I don't touch that. The B was four cents flat so I'm going to just move that up a little bit and the E was two cents flat, so I'm going to move that right to the very edge. So we're going to start there with our values. dandy drill press disc sander to kind of pare this back. over to the guitar. So if you remember on the last reading this was actually eight sharp now it's four flat which means we got lots of real estate to kind of move that forward. These strings are still a bit higher than they need to be which gives me lots to work with. The A string if I remember I think was six cents sharp now it's five cents flat so it can also move forward. So two things are happening here because I've left the saddle high enough as we move the string forward it's actually dropping down too. So we've got lots of thickness in the saddle to correct that. So we're going to move these two forward. The D was pretty close, one cent flat. So I'm just going to breeze that one, hint it a little forward. The G now is sharp so it can actually come back slightly. The B, which was, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was, I think it was four cents flat, it's now seven cents sharp. So it, it needs to come back quite a bit and it will drop down as I file that. I will double check that radius to make sure it matches the fingerboard as I work. The high E string, which was I believe one cent flat, the seventh fret fretted note on each string and its corresponding octave. This one now needs to move back. It was flat before, I moved it too far forward, now it needs to come back. So I'm going to make these adjustments and I'm going to come back and check it again. So this time around, got my little cheat sheet here to make sure I get it right this time. So this is the low E string and it was actually flat. So it's got to come forward. And it just, I'm using the knuckle vise now because we're, we're getting pretty close here. So I'm going to try that. The A was five flat. I'm going to bring that one forward. 
The D was one flat, so I just barely breezed that one. And the third string, or G string, was three cent sharp, so I'll bring that back. The B was seven cent sharp, so I'm going to bring that back quite a bit. And our high E was eight cents. Okay. Back to the guitar. So I'm bringing you in very close here because I'm looking at this and I can see that this little ledge here, it's resting on the rosewood. Can't have that. Want to make sure that this part of the nut goes right down flush against the floor, especially if you have a pickup. So I'm going to go back to the radius sander and just nick that. I'd rather see a little bit of space all the way across than to see it resting on the rosewood. So we're going to just nip that for a second. Back to the guitar. Well that time around we got four out of six strings are bang on the money. We just got to tweak that low A and low E string. They've got to come forward. They're still five flat. Okay, now that we're this close. I know now I can pair back this portion of the saddle to the intonation line. So, here we go. Well, I'll sand that with 600 grit and that'll be our final finesse. Here we go, final call, moment of truth. That's the ticket. On to the compensated nut. Okay, final touch. Sixth string. Open. And first fret. Fifth string. And first fret. Fourth string. Open. And first fret. Third string. Open. And first fret. Second string, open, and first fret. First string, open, and first fret. We're done. And Ken is on his way up, so I'm going to have to make this quick.
So there is the final call on that saddle and this is the final call on the nut. So we went with the 11 to 52 strings at concert pitch. So they're just that tad lighter, one thou all the way across, than your regular 12 to 53.